Okay, awesome. Welcome everyone back to the All Car News Podcast. We're on the second episode of this new season, and we have two guests today from Instagram account Make Car Ads Great Again. Welcome everyone to the show. Thanks for having us. Hello, thank you for letting me be. No problem. Well, I think let's introduce everyone or you guys to everyone on the show. So why don't you get started on that? Sure. Yeah. So uh, my name is Ridgely and I am the, uh, I guess, founder of Make Car Ads Great Again. Awesome. Um, my name. Oh, sorry. My, uh, my name is Xander. I am not the founder of Make Car Ads Great Again, but I am the person who <laughs> posts on there a lot and like help runs the account, the intern, as a lot of the followers like to call it. <laughs> the intern. <laughs> the intern. Awesome. The long term intern. Yeah, well, you guys, the long term unpaid up. intern. <laughs> the long term, very much unpaid intern. You guys have built up a pretty good following on that account as well. And I think it's pretty interesting, kind of like highlighting car ads, because I think those are pretty interesting in the entire industry of advertising. Um, but what kind of got that account started? What was kind of like the basis behind it? So uh, when I was a kid, I'd always get the, uh, you know, when you go to like the, uh, the big car show that would come around every city once a year. I would I would collect all of the brochures and stuff, you know, like for all oh, the yeah. I'd go to every single company and and then and so I, I still have them. In fact, at my parents' house, uh, when I was going through my stuff a few months ago, it was like just bags and bags of these materials. But so as a kid, I loved that. I don't know why, but I really was obsessed it's with like, posters. <laughs> right? Yeah, the brochures. <laughs> Do you? Oh yeah. <laughs> I, maybe it's a universal experience for us, you know. Car no, it has to be hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah, yeah. Every, every other year, I'll go through them and I see like a brochure from like twenty fifteen or something from the car shows. I'm like, oh wow, why do I still have yeah. this? <laughs> the really interesting it. stuff is like the multimedia yeah. stuff from from back in the day, like the CDs and stuff, because that did not age well. But it is you ever <laughs> pop it in the computer? It's interesting to see. Yeah. Um. But yeah, so I love that, and then. Um, I guess over the, I don't know, when I was a little bit older, I, in maybe high school, I started finding online, people were posting like old Porsche ads that had a good sense of humor, very funny, you know, print ads from like the 90s, 80s. The white and I was just, yeah, exactly. Black font, white background, very simple. Um, uh, and which, a lot of which there's a specific ad agency that did those that I'm, mm -hmm. I'm obsessed with their whole history. But um, point is that, Loved it. I thought it was so funny that they had a sense of humor. And I'd known about that and like Land Rover also having some pretty good sense of humor uh, in their marketing materials. And so I had all this stuff stored up on my computer that I found online. I'd always save them because I just would send it to friends and stuff. And one day I was like, you know, I should post this on Instagram and, and not really thinking anything of it, but rather because it was something that I wanted to see on my feed and I just mm -hmm. wasn't finding. And I thought it was so entertaining. And so I just started doing it. And I mean, it really didn't take long at all. It was, that, that was 2018. And by the end of the year, wow. I don't, I don't know what we were at, but maybe 15 or 20 K something like that. Oh, that's maybe awesome. 15. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think the car ads in general are pretty crazy. Even, I mean, today, some of the marketing tactics that some of these manufacturers are doing are just absurd. Like, it's just BMW's account being taken over, or even some of the stuff <laughs> that was Fiat so and Chrysler have done yeah. in the past 10 years, specifically Fiat and Albarth um, ads. But, yeah, I, I think they're all interesting because all these manufacturers are trying to draw as many customers in. And it's turned into a giant game, at least today, of who can make the most insane and absurd thing that yeah. <laughs> will drive the most attention. Well, especially think, with social media yeah oh definitely well i think especially with like cars like they're like a major purchase in people's lives and these ad agencies and these companies they want to convey like you know if you're going to spend 30 40 50 60 plus thousand dollars on a car like mm -hmm. they need to throw that material out there to say like this is what you should buy sometimes they do it factually sometimes they do it very yeah. much factually but i think it's really yeah. just like a, a, a game to try and see you know how ridiculous can you get to really capture that market share of people? Exactly. And how I look at it sometimes. Yeah, I, I might have to contribute to this because where I work at our Volvo dealership, we have an entire wall around like our upstairs of all these old Volvo ads kind of posted up on the walls. So I'm, not, I'm not like old from like the oh, 70s, cool. 80s. So I might have to, I'll take some pictures and send those over to you guys because I think Please they might be interesting. Do. I am. <laughs> would love to see that. In the Volvo cult, I will accept any and all Volvo ads. <laughs> And Lincoln. Yeah, I, I've been outnumbered too, so. by you too. <laughs> we got two Volvo guys here. I'm like required once a month to post Porsche ads so that like 
Rachel doesn't get mad at me. <laughs> right. It's the only reason. Bubble ads. Know. I will say bubble ads are actually very interesting. And it's, the old ones are really interesting too because they're super. kind of like their inventive days. But um, they are. Yeah, definitely very interesting. So yeah, thank you for introducing that. yourself. And I guess why you kind of like got behind that account. Xander, you, you didn't introduce yourself yet. <laughs> so my name is Xander. I um, am... So I'm like I'm I'm a high school senior, right? So I'm still pretty young and new at this whole kind of Instagram game, considering even though that like, you know, this is like the thing that I kind of do a lot of. Um I met Ridgely back in like I think it was like pre-COVID. I think it was like it was like 2019. And so him and I kind of have been like communicating a lot and we, you know, shoot each other DMs like, hey, look at this ad that I found, just general stuff. I think it's only really because I found out that he lived in Baltimore because he was doing a live when he was driving a Porsche from <laughs> his from from somewhere up to, to up to somewhere he was living. Oh, I remember that. Is that how you found Baltimore? out? And I was like, I'm in Baltimore. So we've had wow. that for a while. And so I've just really been following the account for a few years. And I don't know if I'm like jumping like a bit ahead of like it, but I remember like you know, for a while, the account was kind of dormant. Like, it was, there was only, like, there was, like, not a whole lot of posts on it. Like, it was, like, one post every month, maybe longer than that. And I was, like, damn, I really love this account. And I kind of don't want to see it fall by the wayside. So I was, like, you know, let's see if Ridgely will give up his baby. Uh, and let me, <laughs> yeah. let, let me have some input into it. And within five minutes of me sending a text, he's, like, oh, yeah, sure. I was, like, oh, right. this, this works out easily. That's so, awesome. So it, I think it really like, did. This is yeah. like early January. It's almost coming up on a year. By like next month, it'll be a year since I've like yeah. wreaked havoc um, <laughs> on, on, the, on, the, on the accounts. It's it's very funny because a lot of people for a long time didn't realize that there was two of us running it. They still thought it was me. And so like, oh, wow. they'd be like, why are you in Montreal? Like I get friends texting me who like have been following me, you know, or when you were in Canada, they're like, dude, when did you go to Canada? What's this all about? Or whatever. I wasn't I in forget. Canada. I was in Europe. Well, I don't know where you were, but the point was you're somewhere. <laughs> <clears throat> and everybody was like, when did you leave the country? I didn't know about this. And yeah, so it was really cool though, because I had had people over the years who wanted to kind of contribute or like who had DM me. And because once I graduated college, I just didn't have, I started it when I was in college. And once I graduated, I just didn't have the time that I, mm -hmm. that I used to. I was really busy with work. And so I used to post three times a day. That was like the, the key to my success was just every day, yep. three times. Solid. Right. Yeah. And that was for like almost two years. And then it just it became, you know, too much to do. Um, but Xander had messaged me. And the thing that I've always thought with this account, with, with just accounts in general, with, with social media, like um, you got to have a voice in my opinion, because if I had just been posting ads, I mean, there's plenty of other accounts out there that do that, that, that actually I know what I'm friends with, but if I, that's all I was doing and there was no opinions, the captions were just dry. You know, if it was just like cataloging it, it wouldn't have done yep. as well, mm -hmm. but having the opinions and the, you know, the stories and like all the stuff that I used to do on the stories all the time with, with fans and stuff, it was a lot of fun, like Q and A's and stuff like that yeah. or live streams. That's I think the key. And I thought Xander had a really good, um strong opinions on things like <laughs> across the board not that i agreed with him on most of it but i thought you know he's got strong opinions so it would be a, a natural you know evolution yeah it is, it is funny like i definitely like for a little bit i tried <clears throat> not to be like i tried to follow kind of what originally was doing because i didn't want to come in here and completely turn everything on its head but like by March and April, didn't want to pull an Elon. Like, I was, I was, I was kind of like, all right. I was like, you know, I decided to throw my voice into it. And I think, like, that's like, like what originally said. Like, I kind of dislike accounts that are like car related that don't have any personality. Like, they post a post and that's it. Like, mm -hmm. I go on there and I post stupid things on stories and I have fun with people and I answer DMs. Like, I think it's fun to like have somebody behind the account. And right. sometimes that gets me yelled at by followers, but at the same time, <laughs> that's, like, the, that's I, good though. It is like, I, I, create a is good. I come in here and like Richard said, I have plenty of opinions. That is something that everybody who knows me knows I have plenty of opinions. So 
like I'm able to kind of create a bit of a community, play around with some exactly. things, really just 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 play around with some things and see like what works, what doesn't. And that's like yeah. one of my favorite parts of running the account. Yeah, and I think that's stuff a huge aspect. That, like, it's like meaningful engagement. It could be a little bit controversial, but not like too out of the ordinary. I'll never forget like one time I, this was like way back when now, I had a follower who's um, from Germany. I was like visiting New York City. So I was like, oh, I'll just show you some car stuff, show you around, whatever. And he was like, yeah, I love your account because you have very strong opinions about things. So I was like, yeah, <laughs> I do. But it's meaningful and it's fun. And people like to get engaged with it. It always like sparks good right. but sometimes wild conversation in the comments <laughs> or oh, 100. but um mm-hmm. yeah it's, it is definitely good to like form that community around that and i think you guys have done a great job with that your account has really interesting content i think it's getting a good like community and following too i can just tell from some of the q a messages and <laughs> feedback that we're getting on there so. it's 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 so like i get a lot that i don't post like especially when like i do like the car reviews and i post like what i'm doing like that week like with the with the eqs the most recent the EQS and the Bolt, man. Oh, my God. Like, recently, like, I've been, because I'm always like, what do you guys want to know? And I throw in a couple <clears> funny <throat> things. But with the EQS, I mean, like, I was just getting people who were like, you need to review real electric cars. And I mean, not real electric cars, like real vehicles and stop doing this EV stuff. And so I was just kind of like, all right, I'm going to not be professional. Just, like, make fun of people sometimes. Yeah. Because I think, because I think, like, if you're going to come in with, like, constructive criticism, like, to the people who are, like, I don't think the range in this matches the range in this, or I don't like the look of this. Like, that's fine. Like, I love insightful discussion. I say this to everybody in the DMs who gets mad at me. Like, but when you come and just insult the car or insult yeah. me completely baseless, it's like, I'm not going to be nice to you because I don't think you deserve it. Yeah. Right. Which sometimes gets me in trouble. Sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> but I remember this one time kind of right after I'd taken over the account and I this guy was being a bit of an a-hole. And I was like, do you want me to buy us? Originally, I was like, can I block him? And he was like, I just, he's like, I don't like block people. I'm too scared to do that. I'm like, oh, I will. I was like, I have no, I have no issue with. I think I know who you're talking about. Yeah. To skedaddle if they're being mean. And I think that's like wow. a good between the two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Definitely interesting. But I mean, so with these car ads, do you guys have like a favorite? I'm really curious about this. Do you have like a favorite era of car ads or like a favorite manufacturer that has some like, one of the most interesting advertisements that you've seen so far or any like ones that come to mind that like specifically are interesting to point out yeah um late 80s to late 90s print advertising specifically like th- like the volvo porsche land rover okay. what i liked about that era is a lot of these were just eight by 11 magazine ads right they would just be you know put in your in your magazine so they had to grab your attention very quickly and there's an ad agency from the, uh, that started in the 80s called Fallon McElligot, and they had a Porsche contract, and they actually were the one who started this trend where this guy who started this um, ad agency, um, he was not even, uh, like, I forget exactly what his original career was, but he wasn't, um, you know, he was, he was like a lawyer initially. So he was really sharp, very witty, very dry sense of humor. And so he started his this ad agency, Fallon McElligot, and what his whole shtick was, he would have these very blunt one line headlines on these you know, print ads that would grab your attention in a few words. There wasn't a lot of, you know, back before then, all the print ads were just paragraphs. If you ever look at like some mm-hmm. of the stuff we post from like 70s and 60s, they'd have six paragraphs explaining to you, you know, uh, the new Chevrolet Monte Carlo's got Corinthian leather, you know, stuff like yeah, that. Too many details. <laughs> right. Exactly. And so I just love the simplicity because it just grabs your attention. And a lot of these are, are some of the ones that everybody knows, like, um, uh, you know, a lot of the um, like the, this isn't your uncle Olaf's Volvo, you know, things like that. Great one liners, easy to remember, and it catches the eye. And then, yeah. so that's what I liked. That's my, yeah, definitely my favorite definitely. era. Awesome. I think for me, I mean, I agree with Ridgely. I think, there was that golden sweet spot of like 80s and 90s where manufacturers realized that like people aren't going to read essays on a car like they want something quick and easy and i think a lot of european manufacturers just really hit it out of the park i'm not a huge bmw person but i think bmw's advertising is one of the best especially like every once in a while they're really knocking out of the park with stuff um one of my favorite trilogies of ads i posted a few months ago was when uh bmw made fun of 
Audi's winning South Africa car of the year and BMW was like, you know, from the real winner of the world car of the year. And then Audi was like, you can't win a Le Mans race. And then <laughs> Subaru was like, we have the best four wheel drive system and the best uh, Subaru came out of nowhere. It was like, we have the best four wheel drive system. I think when like companies play into that sort of thing, like they make fun of themselves or they make fun of others, like some friendly competition, like those are like my favorite ones because I kind of am a harbinger of chaos. But I also think that it's really interesting to see like what happens when a manufacturer decides to step out of the, here's why you should buy our car and more into the, here's why you shouldn't buy theirs. Like, I think it's interesting yeah. to see like their perspective. Yeah. A little bit of aggressive advertising there. So I'm sorry. I was on my phone. I, I have to find the bubble ads because I know I had a picture of it somewhere. So I'm just yeah. <laughs> for everyone Perfect. listening on the podcast only. Um, I'll read them out loud because they are these short, one, big one-liners that actually are kind of well, not funny, but it's kind of kind of like gives a good emphasis of how Volvo was at this time. So one of them says a station wagon that really moves, and that's just like the main um, ad there. And it's so much a little text, but these are really cool. If you guys are watching the video podcast, I'll kind of put this up. You can see the picture of it there. I think it might be reversed, but <laughs> <laughs> you get an idea of what it looks yeah. like. I can definitely send those over to you guys. Another one also says, that. a Volvo Discovery, rain falls on rear windows too. <laughs> so I think they were just trying to say they claim they invented <laughs> rear the wiper. rear windshield wiper. Yeah, but yeah, it's, it's pretty it's cool stuff. Yeah, and I think the... Sorry to cut you off really quick, but I think no, the um, slogan of Volvo at the time, I think this is 1974 goes the wagon for people who think <laughs> i like that yeah I, you know i i love the way the swedes market their cars because both like saab and volvo for years they they don't really have like their cars aren't faster they're not more luxurious like what is their competitive advantage not to shit on them xander <laughs> but <laughs> and and they know their strengths which is that their clientele are maybe a little more um intelligent right that why why else would you be buying a volvo because maybe you're smart enough to realize if you have a family oh i need the fuel efficiency or whatever but exactly yeah and and it's a lot of stealth wealth and a lot of people who you know don't want to flash and so yeah it's very smart they they bank on their my favorite swedish sub like tagline i think it was a sob ad and it said confound your enemies it said something like (laughs) astound your friends confound your enemies sob or something like that and yeah, i just the, thought brilliant the sob ads are some of the most interesting things i always remember i think top gear is making fun of them i, I love sob but i think top gear <laughs> was doing something on them it was just showing all the ads when they used to like fly the um their airplanes next yeah, to like the right. sobs and they're like yeah. sob like crafted and <laughs> it was something something aviation born related. from jets funny yeah, I, yeah. but yeah i posted i, I posted um the two of them fairly recently uh, one of them was like you know how much money you can get for one sob and like the prices keep going up to the point where it stops being a car and then it's like 7.5 million euros and you can buy like the sob jet and like <laughs> so i think like their whole like advertising with the jet was really funny i think the comments on them are absolutely hysterical of people being like you know well volvo also made jets and bmw also made planes and Ford made planes it's like yeah really just- like how people just like argue with each other and that sort of thing and i think it's also like one of my favorites because i'm also like a mild aviation person and so like i kind of have respect for a, a dual you know mode of transport company even if they're now a mono one form of transport company so. right well you yeah. bmw that's the roundel is the yeah. is the airplane propeller you know spinning yeah. which is it's, cool it's, so it's, it's crazy yeah, it's definitely crazy to see how many of these automotive brands have had some history or still have history in aviation as well. Sure. Even Rolls Royce, they still have their um engine yeah. division for the airplane engine. Yeah, I still cool. think they make jet engines, right? Yep. For like Boeing yeah. or still make one of the for, um, Boeing, I believe. Which is so cool. I think that's very neat. That is pretty impressive, still. But um, yeah. So I want I want to think I want to see what you guys think on like the kind of state of car ads today. I, I, obviously it's a lot more digital it's a lot more in your face it could be on tiktok it could be um the youtube ad or something or it could be something like more of like a deeper film that some of these manufacturers are like investing millions of dollars into to kind of like get like a richer story for their brand history so what do you guys think about this xander gonna take this one away <laughs> um so because i like live on the internet at this point i am exposed to a lot of different type of advertising uh, a lot of youtube advertising and there's like really two types of like, in my head, there's like two types of digital advertising. Stuff. There are the standard car commercials that you see that are like, you know, buy Hyundai now, lease for 279 a month, 
you know, zero APR, whatever. And then there's seven ads, thousand down. <laughs> right. They're, they're, right. They're the, the standard right. ads. And then there's the ones that are like actually like have thought put into them. An ad that I, it's funny, they're bringing this up. A week or so ago, I got an ad on YouTube for the Chevy Bolt. And it was this guy being like, I don't know if I can drive an electric car. The range doesn't hit me. And then it cuts to him in a therapist's office. And the therapist is like, do you drive 250 miles a day? And he's like, I don't. This is a revelation. Like, those are the ads that, like, I really, like, admire because there's thought, there's energy. There's, like, something put into it to make it funny and interesting and not just a standard, like, here's the car and how much you can buy it or lease it for. So, there's those there's some that are like not really car ads that are like just social media marketing stunts like what bmw was doing um and there's also like as you mentioned like tiktok like there's a lot of like weird stuff car accounts will post on tiktok i know that richly found a bentley ad the other oh, month that wow was, that, like, that whole was, series um, that was like yeah. I, my head hurt after watching it and that's why i loved it <laughs> I absolutely love that Bentley series. I like it's followed funny. that account just for that. It's creepy. It's a little creepy. I don't, I don't follow there. Bentley. I should. It's very I like creepy. Just, this I like just started getting back into TikTok. <laughs> the French crash test dummy, dummies. Yeah. Yeah. And um, then, I'm oh, sorry. What were you going to say? No, I was just going to say, I oh. think that like what Xander's saying is it's a lot of guerrilla marketing nowadays mm-hmm. on social media. Social media has really changed the game, which I think is good because the more mediums you have, the more creative you can get. You know, and you see a lot of wacky stuff like, you know, you can make a TikTok clip, you know, and, and advertise there and you're not spending as much as a 30 second TV spot. So because you're not spending as much, you can get more creative than just traditional television or print. You know what I mean? Advertising. Definitely. And I think one of the best examples of this kind of guerrilla marketing, obviously, was just the recent stunt BMW pull. But even Lotus's um, stunts, I don't know if you've seen their advertisements, I think primarily on TikTok they've been going crazy I like, just like memes I it's just either. i don't know who this new um so- social media person they hired was but it, some of them are funny and some of them were just like actually like really like detailed and professional with the cars they all tied in really well they were kind of playing into like the it's TikTok, on lotus tiktok meme stuff okay. yeah to look that but, up afterwards because yeah it was, it, was pretty good. it came up on my feed a while ago and i was like kind of got hooked onto them but yeah we're seeing this all over the place with all these ads and i think it's pretty cool um, especially with yeah. well, at least on the digital side of it, a lot of the influencers being dragged into like actual advertisements from brands I've been seeing a lot now, which is really interesting. It's very cool. I, I absolutely love kind of how things are going right now because you just have more space for creativity. Definitely. Nowadays. Yeah. Right. There's so many different ways you can kind of uh, get their ideas across the people too. Um, so yeah, that's awesome. Now I want to ask you guys another question. So Favorite old car and the favorite car from 2022 that came out this year and what you're looking forward to in 2023. <laughs> That's a tough one. If you want to think about it. But... Like how, how old are we talking? Are we talking like... Unlimited years. You can go back to the 1900s. I don't know. Like, I don't have like favorite cars. Like I have cars that like I love. Like the first car that's coming to my head right now, like, pre like 1990s older is like the rs2 avant for some reason okay. because i think i saw an Instagram post about that and like my favorite car now like as in if i were to go out and buy something now like i know that everybody who knows me is going to give the biggest eye roll when i say the <laughs> v60 polestar because i do genuinely love that car so much not a glb it's not not a glb no <laughs> my God. i've seen I, I've seen I've seen less of them now. I think it's because I think it's because you left. You once I them. once I moved out of Maryland, we had a running thing going because I worked for Mercedes in Maryland. That okay. When the GLB came out, I sold like all the GLBs for the state. It was like the joke because we'd see them all around town, and and I always I legitimately actually really loved the GLB, and I and I would have a customer if they would come in and they wanted X, Y, or Z, I would be like, well, have you thought about the GLB? Because I just love that car so much. And so many people would buy it just because they drove it and it was cheap and it was so, a good value for money. I had but a former friend of mine who once snapped me on Snapchat. She was like, I'm at this Mercedes dealership and there's this guy who kind of looks like you. And I'm oh, like, no. I'm thinking, do you know what I'm talking about? And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, what do you say? I'm like, and then like it clicked in my head. I was like, can you like try and get a picture of him? And of course <laughs> she says, and it's, it's, it's Ridgely. And I'm like, yeah, I'm like, I know him. Like, 
he's somebody I've known. I'm like, of course. And I'm like, I'm like, do you know what you're getting? And she's like, I don't know. She's like, it's boxes. I was like, it's GLB. It's a GLB. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's GLB. And I texted her immediately afterwards, and I was like, so that girl that we was like in the the shop with you, like she's I she's like my friend. Um. So that was like I think the call. I think I remember that. Yeah. Here's that, her parents or whatever. That's funny. <laughs> but um okay so so xander you said old car rs2 new RS2. car v60 pull star the pull, this so, one. so having experience with all these cars <laughs> the whole, new pull star <laughs> they look great i will definitely say they look fantastic i, I do love everyone loves what they look it's just there's just no substance <laughs> <You're> there. <kind. laughs> no, you know, there. and here I was thinking I, I was going to be ganged up on. <laughs> uh, so, look, I, I love the, I love the, like the car, the design, the interiors are cool-ish. That's, you can only get all black on the Pulsar ones, unfortunately, but um, they just don't drive good. I mean, as hard as the Volvo tries, I know it's not supposed to be like a full-on like M3 competitor or something, but I don't know for the money, how much they cost. I just. It's Not unique. Cheap. It's definitely unique. But you're buying I it think, for like I think that's part the Volvo. Like why I like it is because if you like think of like a big fast wagon, like you're gonna spend like a trillion dollars on an E63 AMG or an RS6, and I think like the fact that you can buy a relatively fast wagon from Volvo, who like I'm happy are still making wagons for like yeah. really half the price. Yeah, yeah. E63, like I think that's one of the things that I'm like, I like that about that car. So. Mm-hmm. That, no, that's, yeah, my, I, that's my two cents on that. Yeah, S- Swedish cars this is going to be maybe slightly controversial. I love them. I really do. I like Saab. I'm not a huge Volvo guy, but I like Saab. And Swedish cars, I like them, but I think you just have to know, like going into that brand that, or both brands, that there there's never been a Swedish car that's been more competitive than its German counterpart, in my opinion. And maybe Xander has a has one off the top of his head. I do. I can't think of one. I think I, the 850R. I, I, I think the 850R, the wagon, like the 850R okay. wagon, was like, that was like, aside was early from 2000s? RS2, that was like the first like kind of high performance wagon. Like that was, and they like dominated the touring car championships with it. Like, was that, that, was that like, late 90s or was that early 2000s? I'm trying to remember. That was like the late, that was like the 90s. Okay. Like, v- V8, right? No, there was no V8. It was like it was the oh. it was a five cylinder. It was either a four or a five cylinder. Yeah, and they, I like, think it was a five cylinder. It did, yeah, and it did like it was like aside from the R2, it was like the first like kind of fastish wagon, and like I think that was that might just be me really liking that car, but like that's the only one I can think of that was I think was like kind of. I could, on yeah, the, I could potentially see that. Yeah, because the there wasn't a lot of. Right, wagons. there wasn't an E63 at the time. <laughs> there was no E63 um, or M5 Touring. Yeah, and I like that era of Volvo. Those designs, they're boxy, but they were started, started to sort of um, sand down those edges, you know, so it wasn't quite as boxy. It was like a kind of interesting, like a BMW was doing. I love that late 90s era of design. Yeah, yeah, know, definitely. And there's, just, there's one Volvo that I, not many people know about, and they made very few of them, and very few came to the U.S. I believe it's called the C- it might be the C70 Coupe, not the convertible. I know what you're talking about. I try to. It's I, I've really seen cool looking. Um, I saw I saw one somewhere in orange. It was like this weird, like yeah, deep yeah. orange color, but like, like metallic really? and like, it had a really cool like reflection over it, almost like a burnt orange, like a burnt brown orange. Was but, this the one that the convertible was retractable? No, this one was not a convertible. It but was I'm saying the, the convertible first... version. Oh yeah, the convertible was a hard top retractable. Yeah, it was, and they made a coupe first... of that generation. Yeah, first generation C70 had a coupe option, mm-hmm. and I remember there was one for sale in like Connecticut. I would like go on Auto Trader on my free time and just look for random cars, and there was one for sale for like seven thousand dollars. I was like, that would be the coolest car in the entire. It's world. really wow. cool looking, yeah, and it's really, a really pretty rare ball though. But that would be neat, actually. I gotta just picture of that again. It was really cool looking, but um, just because it because they had you had the retractable hardtop convertible, so it's almost redundant. You know what I mean? But the fact that they made that, I never knew that. That's neat. Mm-hmm. The yeah, one bubble I'm... I really like is that hatchback they made. You know, the C thirty. C thirty. Yes. yes. I really want one. one of those as my first car, but my mom got all like very mom about it. She's like, it doesn't have. <clears throat> 
she wanted like something with a backup camera and a million different safety oh features, which like, I get. Like I, I, I get it. Like that's like a mom thing to worry about. But I was like, right. I don't need a backup camera when I have the largest like glass patch. <laughs> the rear glass. Like, the like, whole yeah. back of the car is glass. <laughs> it's gorgeous. And I'm like so pretty. I will own one in my lifetime. Just that Yeah, now. they're really cool. They made a Polestar version as well. Oh, it's gorgeous. No There's way. a couple Polestar engineers. It's essentially, versions in the US. I've heard it's the same car as like the Focus RS is the time. Yeah. Essentially. That this would is be all neat. from Era. Yeah, so I saw one for sale around us recently. So, but I think it sold for like a lot. For it was a Polestar. It had a really high mileage. That so was like one hundred thirty thousand miles. <laughs> yeah, I've seen. Wow. I've, I've seen them on Auto Trader when they are listed for like twenty five thousand, which is stupid high for one of those. But somebody bought it, so I was like, right. yeah, <laughs> right, awesome. They're willing to pay for it. It, it yeah. found a home, and that's all I'm happy about. <laughs> awesome. So, B sixty Polestar, <laughs> your current yes. car. Right, um like i'm a porsche guy so okay. it's, it's not going to surprise you that <laughs> if, if my probably my favorite older car like for me the maybe one of my favorite cars i've ever owned was my na miata because it was so yeah. just to the point and so the 911 equivalent of that uh is the 964 rs america i know that sounds crazy but it's because it's the Pacific. most raw, <laughs> stripped out. Essentially, the 964, they made the RS in Europe. And then in America, they made the RS America. So it only came to the States. And essentially, it's a 964 RS. But crucially, it has a sunroof, which I love. And you could get air conditioning because um, oh, well, of the American yeah. market. But it's got like the the, 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 the blank you know, door cards with just like little um, ribbon you know, things to open them like they do in the, the newer ones. You know, it's mm -hmm. very... Bare bones, cloth seats, which I love. I'm a big cloth seat fan. It's stripped out. It's mechanical, and it's that sweet spot. Because I think like pre '90s cars are a little archaic, and post '90s they get a little too advanced. I really love that decade of cars. So, 964 sure. RS America okay. is a winner, definitely. Um, in fact, those wheels. I don't know. Probably a few hundred, maybe a thousand. Uh, okay. I mean, they're not terribly expensive either. Like for a 911, uh, they're... I was about to say, like terribly expensive point. by Porsche standards. <laughs> <laughs> by Porsche standards. They go for like a buck 20, maybe 100,000 to 120 on bring a trailer all the time. You know? That's, yeah. That's yeah. Affordable. Which is, Porsche which affordable. Is, yeah. You can't even get a new one for a no. uh, 120. Um, unless it's base. But anyway, so love those. <laughs> um, new car that I'm looking forward to next year. Well, really my favorite new car, and it won't come as a huge surprise since I you know, work for Mercedes, is the new SL. I really, really love that car. And I know it's a 2022, but mm -hmm. it yeah, came no, out so late in 2022 coming, yeah. that to me, it's honestly, it's such a big deal to me because growing up, SL is it's like the 911 and the SL are my two favorite, like, you know, heritage cars. And the SL for the past 20 years has just been on the decline. And I wrote a whole art review about the car where I talked about that because I, I wanted to drive that point home. The, the SL really is just like, it used to be an exciting flagship for the brand that, you know, like you would, if you made it big, what was the first purchase you got? If you were not like a car person, you just wanted, you know, Hey, I got, you know, I, I just got a record deal or I just sold my company. What am I going to buy? So most likely it was an SL, you know, for, for 40 years. That's how it yeah. was. Everybody, you know, such a cool car and uh, a quality car. And um, and then they sort of lost the plot around the 2000s. And now it's finally, it's back. You've got bat little back seats like you used to be able to get, soft top like you used to have. Uh, it's got the performance credentials that compete with like a 911. I mean, I just, I love that car. And it sounds amazing. I've, I've driven them extensively and I just, it's a great car. Awesome. So. Yeah, I, I, I got to see one in person just recently. <laughs> I mean, they look, they look awesome. I have to say. But mm -hmm. I'm going to be interested to see how the GT kind of comes out. I, was, I know they're sharing a platform now, so I want to see how yeah. they kind of like reworked it a little bit. I, I prefer hardtop coupes. I'm not a big convertible person, so That's I fair. respect yeah. the SL. <laughs> I do respect <laughs> it. But yeah, I, it is, I, I have noticed like over the past at least 10 years that last generation SL was like, come on. They let it sit it was for pretty a, bad. a long time. And it was, it was yeah. pretty sad to see that. I and I, I, I'm, it's what did i think that's like the engine totally saved it for me like it was oh yeah so 
so outdated. But like I hear, I'd go to Cars and Coffee and I'd hear an SL sixty three startup, and I'd be like, oh, that's that's why you buy it. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, it's, definitely. It's definitely for the soundtrack and the engine, and but but other than that, the car just the the, the infotainment was dated even when it was new and oh, looks yeah. look like you had two different people designing the front and back of the car. Like I remember my uncle got it the year it came out in like 2013 or 14 and, and I was driving it and he was like, so what do you think? And I'm usually like really excited about his cars. And he's, he's, he's actually the one who got me into Porsches. He's like a Porsche collector. Okay. And so I always love what he gets. And he looked at me and he could just tell like, I, and mind you, I was like 16 or whatever and I, I think i had my learner's permit i wasn't even like that experienced with cars but i could just tell i didn't like it you know something about it, it looked ugly it drove kind of strange and he was like wow you, you, you really you really don't like this car do you i was like no i'm good can we get back to the 911 <laughs> so you know oh boy yeah but yeah they finally now have the chassis the engine and the interior all the stuff to kind of like match up to all the big competitors so that was pretty they cool do. And I think it, the problem with yeah. the SL, at least for a while, it was it was kind of always overshadowed. They had the SLS at the time, and there was the G- yeah. MG GT came out, and then the GT Roadster. So I was like, why do you want an SL? But now I think it's I think it has yeah. a solid place in the lineup, which is cool. That was that was their problem is they had the SL, which was the Halo car, and they said, oh, should we continue making this the Halo car? Nah, screw that. We're gonna go work <laughs> with McLaren and make yeah. an SL that looks just like it, but is like on steroids. No, and see man. who's gonna buy which, you know, and then you know, doors. And you the SLS, right? Yeah, yeah. But I mean, we're here now, and I think they're gonna be good, doing good with that, hopefully. Um, mm-hmm. And the funny thing I always got the complaints about are just like, oh my god, it doesn't have a hard top anymore. I'm like, you don't need a hard top, first yeah. of all. And I think the problem is, is everyone's just seen pictures and they don't notice that like it's not like a flimsy little rag top anymore. It's like these thick like kind of padded like materials that are almost feel like a hard top but it's just like right. lighter and i think it looks cooler too if you're specifically looking for like a roadster convertible type vehicle it just feels yeah. more fitting to have that i guess cloth or whatever fabric they're using so soft like, top technology has come a long way definitely. it really has I'm like, I'm like completely indifferent on the soft top thing like i think some cars look like i think from like a looks perspective like i think there are definitely some cars that look better with a soft top but i also look at some cars and i'm like it like works better with like a hard top like especially i think if a car is like larger like the larger a car is i feel like the more need for like a hard top there is like something like the c70 like i look at that hard top and like that works but i look at like the sl with the hard top and i'm like that's not like it just didn't fit like it seemed yeah. too much yeah well it was kind of strange and, it, and then you had the rear end of the car had to look very bulbous because they had mm-hmm. to fit that top down there yeah there's a reason that hard tops have gone out of fashion if you think about it aside from ferrari i don't think anybody else does it anymore Miata. uh yeah that is a retractable oh, hard top. C- it it. is a hard yeah, top which it's... i don't even understand why you would get the convertible because the regular <laughs> one you can also just take the roof off anyways so. right the targa yeah and, and yeah. yeah that's probably what i would get too because then you have the mm-hmm. glass engine bed you can actually see the engine exactly um but yeah it's funny most manufacturers nowadays have gone away from hard tops there's really not many anymore i mean 20 years ago everybody thought that was the future and it was but that that's how trends are right it came in mm-hmm. and then it went out of fashion again because there were limitations the yeah <clears throat> right the y2k future is it was an interesting <laughs> one <laughs> yeah it's like the jetsons era of the 60s you know they thought all these crazy things were going to happen and then we were like no we're going to go back to basics and we're going to yeah or if you're GM, you make the EV1 and then crush them all. <laughs> that was so sad. I really would love horrible. to drive an EV1. It's like one of my favorite I cars. I, I saw one at the Peterson Museum. It was the first one I've ever seen in person. But I, I have one there, yeah. That, yeah, I keep seeing every once in a while someone finds one or something. They pop out or hidden in like a garage. Like, you guys got to get it that working. It's so cool. Yeah. But, <laughs> keep it um, away from General Motors. They're going to destroy it. Yeah. <laughs> I see one pop up on Reddit. I'm like, don't say where you found it. <laughs> Right. <laughs> yeah. It'll be impounded immediately. Okay. So what would you put an Enzo V12 engine in? <laughs> just, I've been waiting to open this one up because this is really interesting. Now, I got a lot of responses about this. I put this on my story. asked everyone what they would put an Enzo V12 in, engine in because there's one that's just out and available. And there's a lot of mm-hmm. responses, some very silly. But one of them I want to discuss is that it was a very a recurring one is a Miata. <laughs> of course. Really? 
Of course. Why those, not? I think they, the number done everything one, else. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that was the number one response from that. But I guess if you want to go a little bit more grounded, there are some pretty good responses as well. Um, but if you guys have any idea, what would you put a Enzo V12 in? See, I have a great idea. And it may not <laughs> seem grounded at first, but when you, <laughs> when you flesh it out. Is it a 911? Is it, it is a 911? <laughs> no. Is it so a 944? Um, it could be, you know, 928, you could fit that in or 944. But actually, my my answer is going to seem a little uh, extreme at first. But um, do you remember the, uh, what was that Toyota minivan from the 90s? What was that called? The Previa? The Previa. The Previa. I think a Previa. <laughs> now hear me out. It was a mid-engine <laughs> minivan. And I think it's a brilliant idea. I think we need more mid-engine minivans. And I think you put the V12 in the middle of that thing. You lower it a little bit. Take out the back seats, and you have yourself one hell of a fast, you know, car there because it, the, the weight balance is perfect. Yeah. You know, you, it's a two seater because you take all the back seats out, so it's just like having a mid engine supercar, except it's a sleeper. That's like uh, something I, I a... build in Forza Horizon Five. That's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. I love it. I think it's a brilliant idea. The second yeah. someone figures out how to stuff the Hellcat engine in the Pacifica, I think we'll see the Enzo V12 and the Previa. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that would be interesting to see. Yeah, but yeah, I love, I love a mid-engine conversion of like a car that you know, like a minivan, something like that. I just love that idea. I want to see more and of that flushed out. A very, very um off-topic point here: the new mid-engine car that I actually think is extremely underrated and very understood right now is the Pro Sangue. <laughs> Have you guys seen Under the Hood of the new Ferrari Pro Sangue? S- well, um, they're not calling it an SUV, but... I haven't. Is it front mid-engine? Is that what it is? It is front mid-engine to, like, a new extreme I haven't seen before. That engine really? is... In the, it's, like, in the cabin, essentially. And, really? Oh, yeah. I, I find If you guys can find a picture of it looking, like, the hood open, which opens, like, the other way, not normally. The clamshell? Okay. The clamshell hood. Um, like you can just see the whole front of the suspension and because the reason they did that was because that has like a front gearbox to manage the front all-wheel drive system that only comes on for like a certain amount of time like the ff right yeah. it's essentially oh the same it honestly, i'll have to look that it's up the that's insane. hold on it's, oh my God. it's like, so, so far back like you can see like that's i'm gonna look it up. terrific I that's, see. that's ridiculous like it's it's like the, it's your dashboard <laughs> i love it that's I insane love that car is brilliant i tend yeah. to like cars up- the, only, the only concern is that apparently they put all of the like alternators and all the belts and everything on the part that's the closest to your dashboard so wow. if anything goes wrong you have to like either drop it or go underneath the car yeah well, only fail, six of the cylinders are even one. visible yeah it's crazy <laughs> that is so neat i love that they did a v12 i really think that's a great idea because i was afraid that they were going to do the v8 turbo they have been putting in most of their cars which wouldn't yeah. be a bad engine but it's just it's not the might, same. it might come still but um yeah they're making probably. the roma v12 to or whatever the a12 successor is going to be so that's going to be exciting see i love the roma i'm a i think that is the best really? car they've made in probably 30 years i just love that car it's such it a is beautiful looking. car yeah yeah a lot of if they did a v12 it. in that that would be perfect <laughs> but i think they, yeah I, they are i think if i was going to put a v i they just are. decided what i'm going to put a v12 in i think if what? i'm going to put a v12 in anything i'm probably i I'd put it in an XJR. I'd throw Ooh. a vehicle in oh. an XJR. That would, would fit the character the most, of that car. I would make the most instant, like like one of the, like the mid two thousands ones, like before they <clears> went yeah. all like big and bulbous. Like I would make that the most insane. Like God, I'd pull up the cars and coffee. I'd be the coolest person there. <laughs> like, yeah. There's something about putting the like the most insane engine in a car that already makes you look like a mob boss. Yeah, I there's someone I around me has the XKRS GT. I love that. They made like ten of them or something. Wow. It's in white. Wow! Every once in a while, I'll see them like driving it around. It's crazy. It, that I would put a V12 in. Oh, that would, I'd also that would put fit it the character because it's Ferrari. Uh yeah, I could see that. That actually would fit that car even better than it would an XJR. You know, because it's more okay of that style. But again, yeah. Like, but again, like one of the mid two thousands ones, like before this generation, like the previous generation. So the good one, the pretty one. Yeah. <laughs> the pretty one. I put it I put her in the pretty one with the horrific transmission. <laughs> yeah, with the terrible transmission. <laughs> Watch the you transmission probably... turn in the V12. At that point, you could just throw it in Levante and save money on buying a Pro Sangue. <laughs> you could, actually. Yeah. I love the Levante. That's a beautiful SUV. It's not it, built yeah. the best, but I it's love not it. built the best, but they, they do drive back. They drive better than the Ghibli, honestly. 
after like getting around yeah, with them. The but it's pretty interesting. I heard the the, really unimpressed with it. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Ghibli's are they feel cheap and 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 Levante's are pretty cheaply made too. But I love that car. Um, all, every time I'm in it, it's just there's a sense of occasion there's with that car. Something special with it in there. Yeah. yeah. And I the mean, newer interiors like, are actually impressive. Like they fix themselves a little bit. They're better. They're better now. Our, uh, so like in the family, we have one, and it's now like four or five years old, and it was like one of the first Levantes. It was like okay. 2017. Um, it has not aged so well that interior. Um, uh, but you know what? It, uh, this is the thing. Like, it's it's in a handmade Italian car, right? You're not going to go buy a pair of like you know Ferragamo loafers and expect them to hold up as well as Skechers, right? I mean, that's not what they're made for. That's true. So I think you just need to <laughs> give them a little bit of credit. Right, lower your expectations exactly. When you're a getting a Maserati, bit, yeah. yeah, you got to expect like the stitching has literally came off on the seats. Oh, wow. like it's still a Maserati on the on the left. It's okay. It's, stuff, it's but... Italian. It gets a pass. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but I will say, I did. I get. I got experience with the Gracale, the new one, um, smaller Ooh, SUV. Yeah. Yeah. How's that? Um, they are going to print money with those. I can tell you that. But it is essentially. Good. The a Stelvio Alfa Romeo Stelvio two point. I mean, it is a Stelvio two point um, but they really did a great job on the interior. It it feels quality. It feels like well built now. Finally, you know everything feels. It felt like a BMW in there, honestly, a little bit. I'm gonna be honest, but it's a high compliment. I like a higher end BMW. Like the materials are nice. Like it was like they yeah. took the materials and then put it on stuff that it doesn't fall apart. <laughs> so <laughs> they did a good job there. Smart. But I'm gonna be excited to see those. It is really small on the interior. That's what is it like Macan size? It's smaller on the inside. Isn't it like the oh. same car as the new Hornet, or am I getting that wrong? Because I know no, no, that's Hornet. that's the Alfa Romeo Tonale. Right, that's what it is. Dodge Hornet, yeah, those are right. Because I saw I saw the Tonale at the Detroit Auto Show. I mean, not the Tonale, the Hornet at the Detroit Auto Show. That's a car that's going to print money. I was like, so many people are going to like. I think I think it will because a majority of people. Like the the noise that was made when Dodge stopped making the Charger and Challenger is louder than the noise being made when the uh, Hornet was released. But the sa- but the people that would buy a crossover, like it's a crossover that has a red stripe on it. Somebody's gonna buy it. <laughs> I think they're gonna make. I think they're gonna make. I think they're gonna make more money with that than they would with the Charger and Challenger. And the interior is so much better than anything from the Charger and Challenger. Oh I mean, yeah. Materials yeah, crossover wise, is the way to go. Like, I mean, Dodge interiors are horrific, but that one's really good. Pretty bad, yeah. That one, yeah, I don't know. I, I feel I still I'm, I'm a Tonali lover. I feel bad for that poor thing because it's why would why would you get the platform sharing? The other? I know because if you're an American who's not the most cultured, you know, and you're like, <laughs> I gotta have my Dodge. I got I got my Dodge Dart. And Essentially, my Dodge Challenger. But because of the Hornet now, they killed all of the um, non-hybrid tonalities in the U.S. So we're only getting the Q4 hybrid model, oh, which is okay. the highest power. But I believe yeah. the, the Hornet's also going to have that powertrain. So yeah, yeah. it's it's tough because you're yeah, it's going to be hard for Alpha to really succeed when they're limited by what mm-hmm. Dodge is doing. And and who knows? We'll see how that partnership goes. But I mean, I just. I don't think that brand's going to go as, as far as we ho- we would like it to go because yeah. they're limited by their they're very parent company. Limited. They're very limited. Yeah. But meanwhile, Maserati is getting some of the most insane projects within the next two years and all the funding that they could possibly ever have. So right. I'm very excited. Let's see if them. they make it this time because 10 years ago, they said the same thing. <laughs> I think, but, I think um, they're, they're on a set. They're set right now. They have the Gracale and the, the electric version. They have the Gran Turismo now, Gran Cabrio. And luxury versions of both of those MC20. Yeah, MC20 they're like the three different track versions they released, and yeah. they're coming out with an electric version. Um, I think they have some good stuff coming. Up. But from the Gracalis experience, I think they're going to be doing pretty well. I hope. So. I really hope yeah. so because I'm a I'm a, a lover of Maserati, and I think that that brand um, yeah. has been in perpetual state of free fall for like 40 years. You know, they've been like, oh, we're coming up, and then it doesn't pan out, and then we got new investors. And- I have to say, I think they really did do it this time because just from the, the MC20 popularity is nuts. Yeah, it's insane. I've heard good um, things about that car. Yeah, so I, I know at our place, we had a person call from Florida. This is up to New York 
to order one because you couldn't get an allocation anywhere. And wow. he, I, th- I think they start around the low mid 20, 200,000 range. Um, his spec was like 390, 380, just from options. Wow. And it's a yeah. good engine. That's the best part it's of that car, that V8. Engine, yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, I think yeah. it's great, especially because if you won an Italian exotic, a Ferrari in that price point, I mean, you're, you're looking at the, the, the base model. You're looking at the, um, what's the below the Roma, the entry level, the, not the Portofino. Uh, the Portofino. Oh, that is the Portofino. Yeah. Portofino. Yeah. I, I know that's they've been changing engine. the name of that thing every three yeah. years. That's what I'm saying. It's all you can get is a retractable hard top four seater from Ferrari. You know, exactly. so it's like, same money well, you, you could have get. a Lambo door style, crazy twin turbo V6, whatever MC20, and it looks crazy. So, yeah, yeah, but like, I think it's funny. Like, now the MC20, like, is really it's really the only like because uh, like a year ago, you could get like an R8, which also had a bit engine, which was also like in the high hundred thousands, and the NSX, which was about the same kind of 200,000 mark, and that also had a maybe that was a V6, but that had a bit engine. So, that's like the MC20 is now like completely on its own in terms of like under $500,000 mid-engine uh, supercars. Yeah. yeah. And, oh, yeah. yeah. I was going to say, Ferrari has <laughs> just, you know, jacked up the prices on all their mid-engine models. And now, of course, they all have 800 horsepower and exactly. hybrid. So, like, it's the only so, reasonably yeah. priced. Yeah. So, a closing topic that I'm going to throw in here, because this is actually really fitting to what we're talking about right now. Okay. On a previous, this will make sense to people listening to this, but on a previous episode, mm-hmm. I mentioned the upcoming Corvette E-Ray or East thing or whatever they're calling it. Um, it was just leaked recently. And I think that is going to be one of the most underrated vehicles. I don't think people are going to understand, understand it at first, but it's essentially like a hybrid V8 mid-engine supercar at this point, and probably going to be under $100,000 starting or right around $100,000 starting. We'll see what happens. With, with that, without I, dealer markups. Without dealer markups. Yeah, without markups. 85% dealer markup. Right. So you're essentially getting... Because I know they benchmarked the NSX and they were looking at the SF90 GM. So you're going to be essentially getting a mass market NSX with a V8. And it's under, a great soundtrack. Under $150,000, under $100,000 probably. So I think that's going to be like a huge thing for next year when it comes out. But that's yeah. my opinion. <laughs> the C8 so in opinion. general, just the, just the standard, you know, Stingray yeah. or whatever, the C8 I think is one of the best sub one hundred thousand dollar cars you can buy sports cars i mean it, the, the oh, performance fantastic. is amazing the sound system is is incredible the the, the quality of the interior i mean it, i really loved driving it and i think that you know i'm not a really a huge american car guy i'm sort of almost like mm-hmm. a snob if you will but i would rather have that than a cayman i mean it's the same price point why would i buy a cayman why would i buy a exactly. four-cylinder turbocharged cayman when i could have exactly a proper supercar yeah and then you've got now you're looking at a higher price point but still compared to what can you get for 100 grand nowadays i mean it's 100 grand doesn't get you what it used to Mm -hmm. i don't know how they're doing it i don't know either (laughs) and i've heard it's gonna i think it's because gm has like just they have the scalability right like like porsche Mm -hmm. is a big company but they can't like you know Especially with GM, like I think the big thing with GM is why they can do it is because it was like part sharing. Like there's yeah, a lot yeah. of parts in the seat. Like I haven't driven it, but I've sat in like three C8s and I've been like, this interior is nice, but that stock's off of an Equinox. And this part of this is off of like, there's, there's some part sharing. Like a lot of the interior is unique, like the big like trail of controls that kind of separates driving mm-hmm. passenger. Like that whole section is bespoke, but a lot of parts from that, a lot of the, I think the engine is the same engine that you can find in the Camaro, I believe. Or is it totally is it? bespoke? Sure. To Could be. Corvette. Could be the same. Um, because I know that. Because I know that General Motors has like 150 different V8s. So <laughs> like you save a lot of money like outsourcing parts of the engine and outsourcing a lot of it to like other brands. And I think that's probably why that price can go down. But that's a makes very sense. Corvette. Yeah. I'm sure Corvette people will be more than happy to go into my DMs and tell me that I'm wrong. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that probably but, explains it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. I think they're doing a great job with the Corvette brand right now. And obviously they're going to be expanding into a whole bunch more vehicles in this portfolio. But um, I'm just really looking forward to the E-Ray thing. It's a hybrid all-wheel drive V8 mid-engine car for under 150K. That's going to put a lot of think, cars on notice. Even I know yeah, like, a 911 hybrid's coming out. Like. So 
soon. Yes, very, very soon. I'm very excited. <laughs> so that honestly might go directly up against it. And I've heard, I'm hearing power figures of this Corvette around 680 or around that. Wow. Area. Really? Okay. Yeah. Which is so a you're... lot. That's insane. I don't know if it's going to go that high or maybe even 580. I could be very wrong, but yeah. it's going to be a lot. It's, it's a nice, either way, it's a nice um, PowerPoint because I think that a lot of cars that are doing 700, 800, 900 and above it, it's not as usable. I like that 500 club, you know, like that's why the GT3 mm -hmm. has been 500 horsepower for the past 10 years, pretty much. You know, they're never going to yep. exceed that by much, like, because it's just the perfect amount for a, a, a high-end right. supercar. Right. That'll be very exciting to see. I'm, I'm, I am excited for that. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited to see who's going to find the biggest dealer markup on the knee ray. Like, <laughs> I'm excited. I'm, I'm excited to click on a Jalopnik be... article and see like some yeah. dealership in California selling it for three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> Like, well, yeah. speaking of markups, um, G63 4 by 4 our dealership, and I have to confirm oh, this, boy. but I believe we have one that with markup is $600,000. Yeah. That, that's Now, that's the markup they put. Who knows if they'll actually get it. I, I'm Because I'm from Maryland, obviously, uh, so I'm, I'm used to more reasonable markups, but coming out here, because I moved to LA this year. Uh, oh my god the the, the markups out here are insane on everything too like i've had clients who said that they're doing eight grand over on crvs yeah i've seen that on crv yeah. Markup, markups but um haven't been too like horrific like i've seen some pretty interesting stuff like i know it's just giving you know gm some crap for the upmarking of, of the corvette but like i've when i was there a couple weeks ago for the bolt like there were like the bolts they had, they were only marked up by two or three thousand dollars. And I haven't seen like stupid markup. Like the EQS I drove the other day was marked up by only five on a one hundred and twenty four thousand dollar car. I was like, that's not horrific. Yeah, that's, that's pretty not good. great. But I was like, like a lot of dealerships around here, especially like the Coons brand, like they're trying not to mark up cars, which I was because they're volume, right? Those dealerships huge yeah. volume. The Volvo, the Volvo place that I do my stuff at, they're not marking cars up at all. They're selling them. In, they're selling. Is they're that selling White Marsh? Yeah, they're selling them. How so. how is that one doing? Because I know that well, it's new and they had some problems, some growing pains, but they're doing good they're now. Doing, they're doing pretty well. I mean, they just put in an order for like seventy five cars. Wow, good. They're, good yeah, I mean, like I go in there, like I'm like I have a great relationship with them, so I can't like speak to anybody else. But like I go in there and drive a car, and then a week later, it's been sold. So like wow. they're trading a lot of cars in right now, a lot of C40s and XC40s. They're going, they're like, they're going to come in. And I know, and I know that Justin and I had a conversation about issues oh, yeah. with the C40, but I mean, yes. as far as I've seen from the dealership here, I mean, they just like they just shoot out dealer doors. Yeah, the the cars we move are nuts. We we my showroom got um the number one sales in the country in October. Wow, impressive. But um, that New York area, man, there is some crazy oh, high volume stores there. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's absolutely. nuts. I mean, we sell cars like left and right and left and right at Volvo. But yeah, that's definitely crazy right now. Markups are not, but we don't mark any of our cars up. So I'm surprised in the yeah. New York market. None of our, wow. our, 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 my company, we, yeah, no store we mark up anything. That might just I mean, that's, that's good, but. It might be a Volvo thing that if you guys aren't marking them up, the one is here isn't marking them up. I'll have to go see what other dealerships around me are That's doing. Work. If they're not marking them up, it might just be a Volvo in North America thing. I don't think Volvo should, should mark up their cars. <laughs> right. <laughs> <are> pretty expensive. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's expensive for what you get, but it, they, they are quality cars. But yeah. Those, XC, those XC90s. I, see, I, I feel bad. I see like people buying like 2023 XC90s. I'm like, if you just wait like, <laughs> seven months. Right. Those are like the problem child. Like the, the XC90s, as far as I'm aware, those are like the problem child of the lineup. Like those are the ones that have all the JD powers. Yes. yes they do. Which is a shame because it's, it's, you know, such, it's a, such it's a good SUV car. in general. You know, over the past 20 years, I've loved the XC90s. I've yeah. always loved them. So. Awesome. Well, I'm going to wrap up the podcast around now. Thank you guys so much for coming on the show. It was an awesome Thanks, discussion. Thanks, Justin. Thank you. Yeah. Coming. Of course. It's good time. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for having us for... on the podcast. And yeah, of course. Thank you guys for joining us around a little bit of the world of um, old car advertisements. I think that's pretty interesting. So if you guys want to go check out some of those, go over to Make Car Ads Great again on our Instagram and give them a look over. But again, thank you guys for coming on the show. And thank you all for listening to this episode of the All Car News Podcast. And stay tuned for more episodes coming soon.